joining together in space as Atlantis approached for its rendezvous. Look in the payload bay there. You can see the silvery cylinder of the Destiny Laboratory that we were bringing to Earth orbit. Big as a school bus, weighed 30,000 pounds, and it's nestled in the payload bay, and it has to get over to the space station somehow. And this graphic shows you our docked configuration and how the lab had been lifted out of the cargo bay, not by magic, though, but by the talents of our crew. And that's Marsha Ivins in the window of Atlantis. She was at the arm control panel here with a big grin on her face. That means the job is done already. Before the flight, she wore a t-shirt to her training sessions that said, I'm doomed. <laughs> $1.4 billion on her shoulders. And we were, you know, her crewmates, we held the responsibility as well. Taco pointed out, if this goes wrong, if we work for NASA for 100 years, our paychecks will not pay for this laboratory. So we were really um, chewing our fingernails, and this was what Marsha had to do. Outside the docking, uh, outside the windows that you see here, to the right is the docking tunnel connecting the two spacecraft. It blocked all of her windows. She could not see the laboratory with her eyes. So working in the cockpit with computer displays and video screens, she lifted this laboratory out of the payload bay. It's like, uh, as we said, it's like backing a Lamborghini out of the garage with your eyes closed, knowing that the nearest body shop is 200 miles away straight down. And that's the job that she had. And she pulled it off on uh, the fourth day of our flight while Bob and I were getting ready for our spacewalk. And she twirled that lab like uh, someone with uh, skills from on high. And she uh, put that lab into place. And then we got to the work of uh, activating it. And in this picture, you see the laboratory in place at the end of our mission. But there's a, a series of electrical and coolant lines that come from the space station down to the lab to bring it to life. It was inert, turned off, unpowered when we docked it to the uh, station. Our job outside was to be the utility lineman to put this laboratory in place and activate it. So here you see me in my spacesuit. Bob Kirby took this picture a few feet away. And those big fat hoses on the left are the ammonia coolant lines that bring air conditioning and cooling to the lab and then back to the space station's control systems. Also electrical power there and data cables to power up the computers and connect them to the rest of the space station. This laboratory was the nerve center that would allow the crews to operate the station. So Bob and I got to work. And the first time he unplugged one of those ammonia hoses and bent it over to plug it into the laboratory, as he opened up, opened up a valve to make the connection, ammonia began to shoot out of a sticky valve that was stuck open and spray into space. Right into his face, he was enveloped in a cloud of frozen ammonia crystals, very toxic. Of course, he's in a spacesuit. He was all right. But I looked up from where I was working 20 feet away, and I saw a comet tail spreading across the sky of floating snowflakes being blown out into the void. Bob says, I've got a leak here. That's like Apollo 13. Houston, we've got a problem. That was the same tone in his voice. I've got a leak here. I looked up, saw this beautiful comet tail, and my heart and stomach sank to the bottom of my spacesuit boots. This cooling system goes away because of that leak. The lab is crippled, and we've delivered a failure to orbit. So I started to crawl up the handrails to him, but Bob was leading this situation. He had an emergency procedure memorized that allowed him to move upstream to another plumbing connection and isolate the valve upstream and cut off the flow of ammonia. And in a couple of minutes, it took me to get up and help. Uh, he'd already activated that procedure and stopped the flow. When I got there, he was frosted with frozen ammonia over the front of his spacesuit. He was a toxic waste site when I got there. But over the next uh, couple of orbits, we parked him in the sunshine, let the sun evaporate <laughs> all of the uh, crystals. I got a little brush out of the toolbox, and we brushed him off. And uh, we got him cleaned up and presentable before we brought him back inside. But that critical thinking of Bob saved that laboratory. And we could have asked mission control for advice. That would have been too time consuming. He had to execute the training that he'd been given. And uh, by the time I got there, he'd already done the job. So what a leader, what a, what a team, teammate. And a couple of uh, orbits later, he was helping me. I was hooking up some of these electrical lines, holding on with a handrail, moving an electrical plug over to attach it to the lab. And it's a very delicate connection with pins that you can bend if you misalign the connectors. Right in front of me was another electrical switch box it was floating on its wire, and it was hovering right in front of my face. And I'm trying to make this connection. I needed three hands. I only had two. And I thought, what am I going to do? I can't make the connection. I can't risk damaging it. This box, if I move it out of the way, I'm going to drift away from the work site. I'm, I'm in a box. What am I going to do? And then I said, I've got Beamer. <laughs> so I said on the radio, Beamer, can you help me? He came over from a few feet away, plugged the switch in, or plugged the, the plug in while I held the switch out of the way. And 
the two of us got the job done in about a minute. And I was in that zone where I was alone on this spacewalk, not a team member anymore. I was so focused on me that I was forgetting I had a teammate who could help me out. And that was one of the biggest lessons I learned from that spacewalk was teamwork from a guy like Beamer can save the day. Got to let your teammates help you out when you need it. And recognizing that is half the battle. 